Okay, we're alive. I'm here with my good friend Shammai Siskind, Eitan Ben Avram for Aleph Mail here in Pardes Tana. Bless up your beard, bless up your life. And I'm here with the one and only Shammai Siskind of Yerushalayim Ir HaKodesh, one of my unofficial rabbis. He's about 10 years younger than me, but wise beyond my years. And we are here today to talk about Tisha B'Av, because it is the ninth of Av. The sun is going down here in Israel, although around the world, there is still hours to go to this day of remembrance, this day of mourning of, for the destruction of the temples in Jerusalem, as well as other tragedies that occurred during Jewish history. Shammai is wearing his mm. talus and his tefillin, because we are also given permission to wear them in the afternoon, but not during the morning, because they are adornments, which is a very deep concept in them of themselves, right? That these the talus and tefillin are adornments, and therefore we don't wear them in the morning because it brings us joy to wear them. Um, but now we're wearing them in the afternoon. Welcome to ever just tuned in. And um, Shamai, where are you at? What's going on? Yeah, where am I at? Well, we're sliding into home over here with Tisha B'Av. And uh, there's there's a there's a there's a transition that goes on between between the first part of Tisha B'Av in the night and in the morning, and in the later part of Tisha B'Av in the afternoon, the 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 practices on Tisha B'Av they they very strongly reflect uh, the state the state of someone's mourning, someone's mourning God forbid over a close relative, and as we approach Tisha B'Av even in even in the weeks preceding Tisha B'Av the practices of mourning become increasingly more intense, and then on Tisha B'Av itself we are in a in a similar state as to someone who has just uh, uh, heard news of the death of a close relative like that like that's the level of intensity. And then, but by the afternoon, there's, there's a switch, there's a toning down of that, of that, of that morning. And there's some distinct practices that are different. Like we stop sitting on the floor. And as you pointed out, we wear our tefillin again. Um, and these practices are to signify, okay, well, the loss has been felt and, and, you know, we've internalized it and we've, and we felt the anguish and now we need to move forward into, into, into the next stage. So really, the second stage of Tisha B'Av is really look is really in an ironic way. It's already focusing on focusing on the hope of redemption. Um, mm -hmm. Really, throughout all of Tisha B'Av, there's this echo of the fact that Tisha B'Av in its current state is not really what it's supposed to be. You know, we have a we have we have this we have this very very intense anguish and sorrow that we experience on Tisha B'Av, but 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 really, there's there's a there's a hidden message in this day that really this day was destined to be a day of celebration for the Jewish people already from the very beginning of Jewish history, even before the Jewish people entered the land when they were still wandering around in the desert, preparing to enter the land of Israel for the first time. That was really the, the, the original intent of this day to be, to be a day of tremendous, of tremendous national liberation and to, and to ascend to a, to ascend to a higher place of, of, of spiritual maturity and connection to God, it was at that day that the Jewish people were meant to enter the land of Israel, or to at least begin their their initial trek into the land of Israel. So you're before. so you're traveling back in time to the first uh, is, tragedy yeah. of Tisha B'Av, or at least yeah. the first really big notable tragedy, which is that it was on the ninth of Av that Am Yisrael listened to the negative report about the land of Israel from the spies that were sent in. And even though the gates were open for them to go in, even though they had divine assurance that they would be successful, they doubted and uh, refused to enter the land, which then caused them a 40 year exile. Correct. So this is really the first calamity, right? The original sin, if you were, <laughs> of the first Tisha B'Av that really started the first, that really fell the first domino that produced all the other uh, uh, calamities that 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 all happen to fall upon this day, and it's not just ancient tragedies like the destruction of the temple, uh, but but it seems that it seems that throughout the generations, this day is a focal point for negative things. We know that the that the that the that the expulsion from Spain occurred around this time. World War One apparently <laughs> opened up during this time. But this is a this is a this is a perpetual a perpetual time of time of year that is that has that has that has very negative shadowy connotations that we all seem to have to constantly deal with. But just to end off with this theme that I really wanted to uh, hone in on, 
it's not like this that 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 the importance of Tisha B'Av started off only because bad things started happening on this day. On the contrary, this day was destined to be, at least at least in the original plan, was destined to be a day that was very positive, like the most positive it could be. When the Jewish people ascended to their full to their full again spiritual maturity, connection to God, uh, confidence, inner confidence that they were able to succeed and thrive as a nation, and and. And because of that fall, because they gave in to that fear uh, uh, perpetuated by the report of the spies, uh, Tisha B'Av, uh, it developed a completely different theme. But to remember that this day really in its, in its deepest essence has the potential for tremendous, for tremendous redemption, there's one small little practice that we maintain, even, even as we're experiencing the most intense, intense mourning on Tisha B'Av, there's one small practice that we maintain, which is that the Tachanun prayer is omitted throughout the day of Tisha B'Av. What is the Tachanun prayer? It's the beseeching that we do immediately following the Amidah, the silent prayer. Uh, people traditionally, right, they fall, they fall towards the floor. They, right, they stand in a, they sit rather in a, in a, in a, right, in a fallen over position to connote that they're, you know, to, to connote this feeling of lowliness before God, and they, right. And they beseech Hashem, they, perse- they beseech the Creator for whatever it is that they feel that they're lacking. Uh, typically, people, people, people do an accounting of, uh, of their, right, a moral accounting at that time. It's certainly a darker or I would say more ominous type of, type of prayer. And on holidays, this prayer is omitted, right? But we don't say this prayer during holidays. And on Tisha B'Av of all days, this prayer is omitted. Now you might say, well, how does that really help me? Because the whole day we're talking about lamentations and the whole liturgy of that throughout the entire day is already negative. So how does it help me that this one little prayer is omitted? But- Shama, let me just let me just uh, just add some some more flavors to to what your this note about Tachnun. Like, for example, ta- Tachnun is said every day, but on Simchat Torah, on Sukkot, on Passover. Um, when there is a groom who is about to get married that day in the minion, you don't say Tachnun. Like not right. saying Tachnun is a sign of celebration. So Correct. the fact that we're not saying Tachnun on Tisha B'Av, which is a day of mourning, has deep symbolic significance. Correct. Correct. Deep symbolic significance. And you might say, well, how does that really help me if the entire day we're sitting around speaking out lamentations and crying and mourning and everything? How does that really help me if this one little prayer is omitted? But really, it does. It does. It does highlight the root of what we're trying to do. And I feel that this like very subtle message is very often lost. The mourning on Tisha B'Av is not just to recall this you know, 2000 year old trauma and relive it once a year. That's right. To, you know, we can, you know, self-flagellate in some spiritual, in some spiritual way, but, but rather it's, it's to recall the potential that has not yet really been actualized in its deepest essence. That's really what's going on. Yes. There were specific events. Yes. There were specific catastrophes and we know them very well and we list them and we speak about them and we go over them and we don't try to brush them under the rug. And that's a real part of our experience. However, in, the, in, its, in its essence, at the foundations of what's going on, it is recalling the, the hidden potential of this day that has never managed to break forth. It's never managed to come into expression. From the first Tisha B'Av, all the way you know, 3,000 years ago, while the Jewish people were still wandering in the desert, when that day was destined to be the day, the day of national liberation, right? That 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 opportunity was missed, and it's never come about, right? Through all the generations, it's never been able to break forth. And every day when Tisha B'Av comes around, through the intense, intense morning, I mean, this is a it's pretty intense day. We're not eating, we're not drinking, right? We're sitting on the floor, we're speaking out very, very intense lamentations written by people who experienced firsthand tragedies throughout the generations. This is not this is not a light day. Okay, this is a very heavy day, but despite that heaviness, we are we are we are adamant in focusing in on this point that it is all about the fact that this that this tremendous light, this tremendous potential that's hidden in this day is waiting to burst forth. Okay, but Shammai, that's, really, that's really what we're focusing on. In terms of bursting forth, and in terms of you know the the concept and the ideal of what this day is about. Where, like, you know, I want to just check in on a personal level in terms of how I'm experiencing that. You follow what I'm saying? Because it's like we're talking, we're saying it's a day of mourning, but am I actually mourning? Like, I just had a baby. He's absolutely un, un, it's hard for me to conceive of how cute he is and how much joy he brings into my life when he smiles. I can, I can, I can, I can.
test to that. He's pretty cute. Yes. Right. And so it's like, so, so, but it's Tisha B'Av and I'm supposed to be warning. And, you know, so, so it's like on a personal level, I just, I'm curious, you know, because this is something that is discussed and I think it's worth discussing is like, are, are we really able to mourn for the temple? Are we who are living in 5780, 2020, an experience that happened so long ago, we're able to read about it. We're able to, you know, there's davening about it, but do we actually experience this mourning? Do we actually experience this loss? You know, and I think that loss is really the right word. You know, it's like, do we experience a sense of loss, like living in Eretz Yisrael and I can go around the corner and buy some shawarma, you know, and I got my nice yard, like, you know, and I have my family, like, am I really experiencing loss over the temple? You know, right, so I'm going really? so to, so I'm going to throw it. So I'm going to throw it back to you. Okay. I'm going to throw it okay. back to you before, before you, before you had a son, did you want a son? Did you want a child? Yes. You did, right? Yeah. So if I were to ask you, and we had we we did have com we did have a few conversations about 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 marriage and family before you actually were married and had a family. Um, if I were to ask you at that period of time, you know, how do you know that you want to be married with a family? Have you ever experienced it? Do you really think that it's really the greatest thing? I mean, how do you know? You just have like you're just. I mean, maybe it's just a societal construct that everyone's telling you that this is what you should do. Maybe you really don't want it, right? Mm -hmm. How do you That's know? That very really good question. Want, Those are right? really good questions. So, so I have, so I have an answer, and I think, and I, and I think that this answer is the only is is the only legitimate answer. The things that are part of our deepest essence, you don't need to have an explanation or even an external trigger as to why you want them, because they're just naturally part of your being. Mm -hmm. So, so, so I want to, I want to hit that. Jewish people, the Jewish people living today, don't need to have experienced the temple directly in order to know that this is what they're supposed to be experiencing. And so the fact I, that there is a gaping hole in the hearts and minds of anyone who has, who has their Jewish consciousness within the forefront of their mind. Okay, but emphasis on the word Jewish consciousness on the forefront of their minds. And there are even people who keep kosher and Shabbos who don't necessarily feel that loss. But I want to share a story of how I first began to tap into that Jewish consciousness, which is when I was 20 years old, it was the second time in my life I went to the Western Wall. The first time was when I was about 13 and I didn't experience anything. Um, but the second time I was 20 years old and I was walking down the steps to the Western Wall and I was highly skeptical of Judaism. I, if you ask me if I was Jewish, I'd be like, well, I'm culturally Jewish, but I'm not really Jewish. This was before I discovered that Judaism was a spiritual path and that I had a calling to be a Jew. And um, I was walking to the Western Wall and I said, I'm gonna see a really big wall made of really big bricks that's really old and nothing is gonna happen. That's what I said to myself walking down to the wall, right? And then when I got to the wall, I was standing at the balcony and I said, I'm not even gonna go to the wall. I don't even wanna be like those religious people who come and talk to this wall and worship this wall. And, you know, I don't wanna, I don't want to be like them, those crazy people. Um, and then I looked down and I noticed that my hands were shaking. Um, and I was at a loss for words. I was in the middle of a conversation with someone who walked to the wall with me and I was at a loss for words. My hands were shaking and I felt these waves of energy coming off the wall. And I never experienced anything like this in my life. I was totally sober and like, and I was like, wow, this is really affecting me. And then all of a sudden, I just felt this desire to go to the wall. I don't know where it came from. And so I walked around the little fence, you know, down the platform to the actual wall. And I saw everybody was going like this. So I went like this. And I was just standing there against, the, like, leaning against the wall. And something inside of me was like, I am home. Right. And I didn't know where it came from because I didn't even know that the wall was part of the Beta Migdash. I didn't even know there was a Beta Migdash. I didn't know any of that stuff. But some part of me was like, I am home. And I didn't even know that at the end of the Haggadah, we say, Lashana Haba, the Yerushalayim. Right. I didn't even know that we always prayed for over 2,000 years next year in Jerusalem. I didn't know that, that, that the, the little Jew inside of me was finally returning to Yerushalayim. I didn't know, but some part of me knew, right? And that's exactly connecting to what you're saying, that there are some things that are so deep that you don't need an explanation. Yeah. 
Well, thank you for sharing, Eitan. I apologize that I have to run because they're waiting for me to dive in. Um, oh, really? This is it? Thank you for, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, for, thank you for hopping me, though. I appreciate it. All right. That was good. All right. I'll talk later, man. All right. Um, so, so actually, I'm going to keep going, and I'll talk to you. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Later, brother. Okay, so now it's just me um, here in the Holy Land, and I'm just, I'm just going to keep on rolling with that. So, so there is this deep, deep connection. Some Jews are cognizant of it. Some Jews are not cognizant of it, that inside of them is this connection to Yerushalayim, is this connection to the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. Um, by the way, for those of you who are wondering why I have my beard in a ponytail, um, considering that I run Aleph Mail, which is a beard grooming company, it's because this is the best way for me to take care of my son because I wear him. And when I'm looking down and my beard gets caught and so I put in a little ponytail so it's easier to pull aside. That's just a side note. But so, so this deep connection to Yerushalayim, this deep connection to the temple that's inside every Jew, I can personally attest to the reality of that. Um, and that's actually the basis of my faith, the basis of my amuna in Torah, the basis of why I'm wearing a kippah, why I put on tzitzit, why I keep Shabbos, why I keep kosher, is actually because I came to the temple in Yerushalayim and a part of me said I'm home and nobody taught that to me. I didn't learn it in Hebrew school. It wasn't something that I grew up with as some sort of cultural um, dogma that people said this is the truth and I was just parroting what people said. It was the opposite. I grew up eating bacon, egg, and cheese on a bagel, right? I grew up not identifying as Jewish at all like I said, I didn't know that there was a temple in Jerusalem. I didn't know about any of that stuff, but some part of me knew that I was home, right? A deeper part of me than my conscious mind. And, and so that's like level one in terms of understanding what it means that the temple was lost, right? It means that like, you know, there is a spiritual Kesher that all Jews have to the temple um, that is real. That being said, when the temple was destroyed, there's this concept that with the destruction of the temple, the Jewish people went into exile because the temple was the physical manifestation of godliness in the world. And when there is godliness in the world, that is also a reflection of a certain level of wholeness that in order for the temple to exist, there needs to be a level of shlemut, a level of wholeness in the world. And if the temple is destroyed, it means that on a, on a, on a, on a practical level, there is a level of brokenness in the world, that the two are connected, that the temple being able to stand and the world being in a state of wholeness are both connected. They're connected to each other. And so, and so if we look at the world now, and there's a statement in the Talmud, which is that, you know, that um, every generation does not, that does not rebuild the temple, it is as if they destroy the temple. So what does that mean? It means that in every generation, we have the potential, we have the opportunity to bring that wholeness into the world. We have that opportunity to, to rebuild the world, tikkun olam, to fix the world. And every generation that doesn't take that opportunity, it's as if they destroyed the temple, they didn't bring that wholeness to the world that they could have, right? And so that means that we have a call, we have an injunction to bring wholeness to the world, to repair the world. And obviously that starts with fixing ourselves, and then our family and then community. And it's a constant process. Um, we're not Superman. I'm not the Messiah. You're not the Messiah as far as I know, which means that we have to start on an individual level. There's tikkun olam and tikkun ha'adam. Tikkun olam means fixing the world, and tikkun ha'adam means fixing of the man, meaning fixing ourselves, fixing ourselves on that individual level. But so on that note, you know, when I look at the world now, it's true that, the, the, that the, I see that there's such a deep lack of wholeness. And in terms of that sense of loss, when I look at the division that's happening internally here amongst my tribe, the Jewish people, when I look at the divisions and the tragedies, both man-made tragedies and nature-made tragedies that are happening in the world, right? When I look at the, the lack of love that's occurring on so many levels, I see that, yes, there is that which I should sit on the floor and mourn because most of the time I need to function, right? Most of the time it's like, I need to get stuff done, right? I don't have time to sit on the floor and cry over the state of the world, right? None of us do, 
right? But Tishba Av is the idea, it's the day that it's like we sit on the floor and we mourn for the temple and mourning for the temple means mourning for living in a state of exile and mourning for living in a state of exile means mourning for the brokenness of the world, right? Today is the day that you don't eat, you don't drink, you don't have, you don't wear leather shoes, you don't engage in the normal things that just bring a little bit nicerness to your day, right? And it's like you're full on in mourning for the destruction of the temple, for the exile we're living in, for the brokenness of the world. And I think it's really important to do that. I think it's really important to do that because it's when you acknowledge that sense of loss that you can begin to yearn. And I heard a very deep teaching from Rabbi Gabriel Goldfeder, who was um, sharing something that he took from Rabbi Nachman, which is that like when you feel that deep loss, you can do two things, right? You can either grow cynical and bitter or you can yearn. You can start yearning for that vision of wholeness, right? When you feel that like brokenness inside you, you can either let the color drain out of your life and it's like everything is just worms, right? Or you can be like, I am yearning for that higher vision. I'm yearning for that higher vision of wholeness. I'm yearning for that higher vision of families talking to each other and being connected. I'm yearning for that higher vision of people coming together as one in peace and able, being able to just have civil conversations and agreeing to disagree. I'm yearning for environmental sanity in which we don't have to be afraid of drinking the water from the rivers and streams because they're not poisoned, right? I'm yearning for leadership that's truly of the people, by the people, and for the people, so that you, so we don't have constant cynical distrust of our government. Um, I'm yearning for you know being able to buy products and know that they're ecologically friendly and that no human beings were exploited in the making of these products. There's just any number of areas. I'm yearning that my taxes are used for the right reasons, right? I'm It's like there's just any number of places where it's like, yeah, man, there's so much messed up stuff in the world. Right. And today is the day that we sit on the floor and we acknowledge that loss. Because why is there a loss? Because that's not just the way it is. It's not just the way it's supposed to be. It's not just the way it's supposed to be. Right. When I was a little kid, you know, and there was something wrong, I would say, why? And someone would always say, well, that's just the way it is. That's reality. Right. And it's like, no, that's not the way it is, is not the way it's supposed to be. And reality or how reality is functioning is not the way it's supposed to be functioning, which is why there's that sense of loss, which means that we need to yearn for a greater reality, for a vision of reality. And if we're feeling that loss and we're mourning, it means that we're tapped into something real, right? We're tapped in, right? And everybody has their vision. And obviously it's a conversation and a dialogue and it's a constant process of refinement. But the point is that I can say right now that in my heart, I'm yearning for a better world, right? I'm yearning for a world in which there's peace and justice and truth. I'm yearning for a world in which we're leading with compassion and kindness, right? I'm yearning for a world in which, you know, these imaginary walls that create fear that separate us as human beings are able that we're able to see through it because fear is false evidence appearing real and we're able to embrace each other. You know, it says in the Torah, love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't say in your Torah, fear your neighbor and sue them, right? But too many times we're fearing our neighbors and we wanna sue them, right? And that's not the world we're supposed to be living in. And how do I know that? Because I'm yearning deep in my heart for that higher world why? Because I'm feeling a sense of loss. And so when we feel that loss, it's like, yes, the temple still lays in destruction. We still need to rebuild the temple. We still need to come together in wholeness. And so may Hashem bless you on, as an individual on your level to rebuild your temple right? Because, you know, it starts inside and there's a temple inside you, which is your relationship with God. I'm experiencing recently with the birth of my son, that the nature of my prayers have changed. And when I'm reciting to him, when I'm saying Psalms in the morning and I'm putting on my tefillin and I'm putting on my um, talis and I'm davening, it's like, wow, it's like, I'm a Jew, I'm a priest of God and I'm here to pray. And my home is my temple. And how many homes are broken? And how many of us feel broken inside? So rebuilding the Beta Migdash starts internally, just inside of us, and then externally in our own homes, right? Like clean your room, you know? And then expanding to our family, expanding to our community, loving our neighbor as ourselves, right? So 
May Hashem bless you to be able to feel that loss, right? May Hashem bless you to go there. Today is the day to go there. May Hashem bless you to feel that loss in your heart. And may Hashem bless you to feel that underneath that loss is a yearning for wholeness. May Hashem bless you to feel that, that wholeness. Because if you're yearning for it, then it's like somewhere inside you. So may Hashem bless you to feel that wholeness and may Hashem bless you to take actions which are reflections of that wholeness and to rebuild yourself, rebuild your life, rebuild the world and rebuild the Beit HaMikdash. This is Eitan Ben Avram for Aleph Male. Peace and Shalom.